Over the past 160 years, some of the most famous archaeologists in the United States have passed by this valley in the northeast Georgia mountains on their way from the Nacoochee Mound to the Tugaloo Mounds without ever stopping to look. Only a chance remark from a commercial vegetable farmer in the late summer of 2019 brought our attention. Many people once lived here. We're still trying to solve the mystery of who they were. The Amy's Creek Valley is located adjacent to Georgia Highway 17 and 255, which connects Clarksville to the northwest with the Nacoochee Valley and Helen, Georgia. The Nacoochee Valley contained the intersection of many important trade routes in ancient times to interconnected eastern North America. Amy's Creek Valley was located adjacent to the ST Trail, which connected the head of freight canoe transportation on the Tugaloo River to the Nacoochee Valley and the headwaters of the Chattahoochee River. Originally, the famous Unicoi Trail passed a couple miles to the northeast of Amy's Creek, but was directly connected by a trade path. French ethnologist and historian Charles de Rochefort wrote in 1658 that the construction of the Unicoi Trail was ordered by an Appalachian queen after an enemy province, the Ustinali, closed off the route to the Tennessee River via the Little Tennessee River. After gold was officially discovered in the Nacoochee Valley in 1828, the Unicoi Turnpike was routed along the old Ishati Trail, then turned northward along the headwaters of the Chattahoochee River to connect with the Hawassi River. Another important trail arrived in the Amy's Creek Valley from the north. This was the one that interconnected the towns of Salty and Soki, which are major centers of the Soki people. Amy's Creek begins on the flanks of a uh, spur of Alec Mountain, then flows southward approximately three miles to the Chattahoochee River. Most of the distance between the confluence of the creek and the Chattahoochee and the primary archaeological zone is a deep ravine where uh, it would be very difficult to put up housing. However, in 1939, archaeologist Robert Warship did find evidence of a long-term habitation in the fertile flatlands next to the Chattahoochee River. Now this is typically where you find southeastern Native American occupation sites, but what we're going to find very interesting is that the primary archaeological zone is nothing like that. We're going to start on the eastern part of the archaeological zone of where we found evidence of intense occupation. The location consists of gently roiling land that contains very little area of flat alluvial soil that would be typical of a southeastern Native American town site elsewhere. But there definitely are many signs of intense occupation by human beings prior to arrival of white settlers. The northern end of the track is a fairly leveled terrace overlooking the remainder of the property. I think this is an acropolis. It's very similar in character to sites we've seen near Batesville, Georgia, the Soki site. It slopes down to a series of man-made terraces and then to Amy's Creek. 
Near Amy's Creek is a stone retaining wall about 200 feet long, which propels a level plaza. Then above it is a mound approximately 300 feet long. Not a tall mound, but a long one, uh, approximately three to 400 feet long, perhaps originally maybe five to six feet high at the most. The area between the mound uphill to the Acropolis is gently sloped. There are some dark circles and rectangles here. This may have been a village site, or it also could have been the location where some type of terrace agriculture occurred. Only archeological study can determine that question. We're on the Acropolis of a large town site here at Amy's Creek. Uh, not very visible at ground level. If you look closely, you start seeing terraces. And at one location, there is a stone re retaining wall that seems very ancient. The character here is very similar to the Acropolis that we found in Batesville, Georgia, which is about seven miles north of this location. Uh, my presumption is the same people, the Shoki, built both places. It's a spectacular site. Unfortunately, we're in early fall after a drought, so it's not particularly green as it would have been earlier this year. But you can begin to get the feeling of a flat area that was the Acropolis sloping down with terraces to another area where there was a large mound running east-west that has a stone retaining wall on it. Again, we're just doing a 360 degree panorama of the site so you can get a feeling of where we are today. Amy's Creek begins on a top of a ridge extending westward from Alec Mountain. It flows down a steep ravine into the western section of occupied area. Although the terrain here is rather steep, even in the bottom of the valley, there's many indications of a long-term and dense occupation. As you can see, there's an area where there's a village site, so many postures are found. There is a long effigy built out of piled stone. There are carved boulder. There's some petroglyphs. Uh, there are stone circles. There are small stone mounds and small earthen mounds. Plus, it's an extremely large mound. It would have been one of the largest mounds in Georgia. Of the terrain created by the collapse of the ancient vault caldera. We're doing a panoramic sweep of Amy's Creek first. as we go back and forth and finally I want to show you something very interesting this is a effigy you see right there that's a stone effigy that's barely visible at ground level but when you look at it as satellite imagery it becomes a very pronounced physical feature of the valley it's in the shape of a ceremonial base the headwaters of Amy's Creek trickles through the stone structure. It appears to have been some type of water retention facility at the upper end that then flowed into a second one down below. Perhaps this area was irrigated croplands and was terraced at one time. It has been heavily cultivated for about 180 years. The effigy is tilted at about 7 degrees north northwest i don't think that has any great significance uh, symbolically and probably is a reflective of the flow of the original stream in late september 2019 alan fritchie the owner of fritchie's farm market which you see here happened to mention to me that in the early 1990s his father had made a deal with the state department of transportation to somehow trade or sell what he thought was an Indian mound across the street from the market. He didn't know much about it and wasn't sure it was an Indian mound but wanted me to look into the question. It took some while to do research to answer his question. I first surveyed the property and walked around and I saw no evidence of a mound anywhere at ground level. I did see a few pieces of Indian pottery that appeared to be black and shiny. 
However, looking at high-resolution satellite imagery told a very different story. Quite visible is a diamond-shaped mound oriented to the winter solstice sunset with a long ramp to the northwest. Less visible, but still there, is a much larger darkened soil, uh, roughly the shape of an oval, which appears to be a later mound which was scraped away for the most part, leaving a very small image there to, on the property. To the northwest of the ramp was a 30-foot diameter circle or rectangle, which appears to be the imprint of another mound or perhaps a large structure. Looking at the satellite imagery from another angle, the diamond with the large ramp becomes very, very apparent in this site. The, again, you can see a discoloration in the soil of a much larger mound extending more to the north. There's no doubt that this was a mound site. The original mound is quite visible. But what did subsequent stages of the mound look like? That's a, that's a much tougher question to answer. The, as you see, the discolored soil of the later phases is not quite as visible. I searched the internet and could find no aerial photography of that part of Habersham County. Mr. Fritchie had told me that originally the mound or hill or whatever it was had been covered in pine trees and that prior to the property being leveled it had been subdivided into lots and in the process of making it ready for surveyors the trees had been removed. I looked around on the internet for several weeks to find older aerial photographs of the site and could find none. I contacted the agriculture extension agent and they no longer maintain site files with the photographs like they used to in earlier eras. I then contacted the Habersham County government and they referred me to the tax assessor's office. The ladies at the tax assessor's office said yes, they might have some from an olden era, but it was in the old building and that they would agree to go over there someday and go through the archives. And yes, indeed, they found older photographs, perfect ones. The first photograph they found was made in 1987, just at the moment after the pine trees had been cut down. Here you can see there is a roundish oval mound that also had a platform going, or ramp rather, going from the northwest to the mound. It's very visible in this photograph. Ladies at the tax assessor's office found me a map, an aerial photograph made in 1993 at the exact moment that State Department of Transportation bulldozers and dump up trucks were destroying the mound. There was no question about it. This hill was not a hill, but a mound that covered a, a much older mound. Actually, there was two mounds involved when we looked closely at the aerial photographs. My next step was to go on site and make some measurements of the dark imprint of the first diamond-shaped mound to determine more or less what it looked like. While living in western Lumpkin County, Georgia, I was able to discover an intriguing mound that had been actually named and numbered by archaeologist Robert Worship in 1939, but he couldn't find the mound. He just gave it a name anyway because he saw other people verified it existed. It was very similar in shape and dimension to the footprints that I found on the Frenchy property. This was intriguing. The only real difference between the two mounds was that the Frenchy Mound was oriented to the winter solstice sunrise, whereas the Harbin Mound in Dawson County was oriented to the winter solstice sunset. Unfortunately, after I wrote an article describing my rediscovery of this very interesting and unusual mound, the owner decided to destroy it. By 2017, Google Maps showed that very little remained of the mound. Nevertheless, by having good photography of what the other mound looked like in a perfect form, I was able to recreate the appearance of the original Fritchie mound when it was diamond shaped and had a long ramp. The only real difference between the two mounds was that the Fritchie's 
mound's original footprint showed it was broader in the center of the diamond than was the Harbin mound. Here you see a three-dimensional image of the original Fritchie mound superimposed over the modern 3D satellite imagery, matching the footprint exactly. Here's a profile three-dimensional image of the first phase of the Fritchie Mound superimposed over the landscape there in the valley. I used an enhancement software to re-examine the satellite imagery of the side of the Fritchie Mound and got some real surprises. You notice on the drawing that there are rectangular structures to the west of the mound that the second phase of this mound was a round mound about 105 feet in diameter and that the uh, lowest level of this site was not a mound but a rectangular structure. This is fascinating. Beyond that, we can see that there's a great deal of activity on the site, even though it's merely a high point along a major route between the headwaters of the Savannah River and the headwaters of the Chattahoochee River, but not the typical site you'd find a large Mississippian town. This is a detailed view of the area where the oldest mound existed and also the rectangular structure that was underneath it. It was created with near visible infrared light. Notice the details uh, that appear on the ground. The structure seems to have an apse on it and there may have been other rectangular and round structures also that predated the first mound. The discovery of a rectangular structure underneath a mound is highly significant because you see the same arrangement was found over a half century ago at Etowah Mounds National Historic Landmark in Cartersville, Georgia. This is a photograph taken in 1956 of the base of Mound C at Etowah Mounds. Notice in the center is the tomb, which originally was surrounded by logs that contained the famous Etowah marble statues. Around it was built a circular structure, which may have been a mound or a building, and then around it was constructed another rectangular structure. The strong similarity between Mound C at Etowah Mounds and the Fritchie's Mounds original structures is highly significant. It likely means that the same people settled in both locations, but the, the big question is, the Fritchie Mound is a located area entirely different geographically in Etowah Mounds is very little bottomland, whereas the bottomland around Etowah Mounds stretches for about 38 miles. This is the probable appearance of the second stage of the Fritzy Mound, but in reality we don't know if it had a flat top knot. It may have been merely a dome of earth dumped on top of the original mound and perhaps even used as a burial mound. Stated earlier, the diameter of the second stage was probably around 100 five feet. We don't know its height, but my guess is it's something in the range of 10 to 15 feet. This is a bird's eye view of the third stage of the mound's construction. It was approximately 250 feet in diameter by 105 or 120 feet. It was, as I said, an oval with a large ramp going down to the northwest side. In its final form, the Fritchie Mound would have been a spectacular landmark for any traveler going up and down the Itzatee Trail as it was on a knoll that could be seen for a long distance. This bird's eye view shows the relationship of the mound to the Highway 17 corridor. It is absolutely amazing that not one archaeologist ever noticed the structure since it was directly adjacent to a major travel route east-west. This bird's eye view shows the relationship of the Frisian Mound to Yona Mountain, which was to the southeast. Approximately 200 yards immediately to the southeast of my home is an enigmatic carved stone boulder. It's, it's more than just petroglyphs because 
from one angle, it looks like a coal snake and even has diamonds in it like a, a, a say, a timber rattler. On the other hand, the other face is a composition that includes a human figure. This uh, boulder may have been carved much earlier than the Fritchie Mound or some of the other mounds in the valley. We really don't know. From the south side of the boulder, you can see what appears to be the eyes of the snake and perhaps the tail on top. The northwestern corner of this boulder contains a seated man or woman with arms outstretched uh, wearing some type of bracelet. The carving seems to be intentionally defaced because the torso and the lower half of the head have been chipped out. One can see the headdress of the person. We know they're looking to the left or that's to the east. Does that signify something? I don't know. As we leave the Amy's Creek Valley, we walk away with many unanswered questions. My gut feeling is this was a sacred place for many thousands of years and we may be looking at the structures created by many different peoples from many different places. It only will be when serious comprehensive archeological work is done in this valley that we may partially understand it. Until then, just remember what is the truth today may change tomorrow. One plausible explanation to the lack of extensive tillable land in the Amos Creek Valley, yet the abundance of structures, is that this was always a sacred precinct. Maybe it was only where the elite and their retainers lived, and the actual large-scale farming only occurred down in the very rich bottomlands of the Chattahoochee River, approximately three miles to the south from there. We'll find out more as time goes on. Thank you for joining us.